Today, I want to talk about the Season 2 finale of Invincible, and with it, why a lot of people are already over the Invincible animated series, even if they're getting exactly what was promised to them in the premise of the show, which isn't designed to be a superhero show, but rather is based off of a story that is very much about exploiting the dynamics of superhero comics. My name is Deep Cut, welcome back to Cartoon Universe, hit that subscribe button, and leave a comment telling me which character you think the animators spent a little too much time I'm drawing in their tight superhero costumes. Now, when Invincible first aired on Amazon Prime, this show was an absolute hit, and it's easy to see why. For decades now, the entertainment industry has been pushing the superhero genre as far as it can with genre-bending approaches to the old comic book hero format. It started with DC introducing the more serious version of Batman with Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. Batman already had some of the more serious approaches to storytelling with some of its earlier comics, as well as its 90s animated series, but the live-action trilogy allowed Batman, as a superhero with no powers, to have his job displayed a bit more realistically. It's still about a man in a costume fighting bad guys while refusing to use guns, but they approach it almost like a thought experiment, a question of how someone would really approach being Batman. Even if some of you might complain that it's not realistic for X reason or Y reason, the point was that it took itself more seriously than any of the adaptions that came for it, with the adaptions being what most of the mainstream audience knows about Batman as opposed to its original comics. While Nolan's trilogy focused on just being realistic, many people saw it as being darker as a result. And from there, DC and Marvel and really others would begin to reboot their franchises with more dark angles of their original comic book exploits. For DC, they would lean so heavily into this that they would become known for being unnecessarily edgy without being remotely serious or aiming for that more realistic approach that the Dark Knight trilogy had. Marvel, with its transition into Disney, started off a bit more serious and gritty, but quickly evolved into more comedic superhero plotlines where each movie, and even TV show, does its best to put the superhero formula into a new genre. Multiverse of Madness, for instance, was supposed to be a superhero horror film. The Scarlet Witch TV show was presented as a sitcom, and from what I understand, Ant-Man and the Wasp was written to be like a buddy cop film. Before these theatrical reboots began to take off with mainstream audiences, however, Invincible was already pushing the genre to new limits with its own comic book series for comic book enthusiasts. As I said, mainstream comics already had some gritty and serious approaches to their stories, but for the most part, comics had fallen to schoolboy heroic rules. In order to make comics safe for younger audiences, death was treated rather tenderly, with heroes being afraid of killing, death itself being portrayed as rather rare and dramatic, and the heroes often avoiding guns as a weapon because of how easily accessible they are in America, with heroes who need weapons instead relying heavily on fantasy weapons. Invincible took all those limits of mainstream comic book storytelling that had been forming for over 50 years by the time issue 1 came out in 2003, and decided to tell a story that specifically focused on those ignored ideas, particularly the potential for violence and trauma in a world filled with superheroes and beings with powers. For this story, they didn't want to have just some singular hero rising up and figuring out what it means to be a hero, but instead, they wanted a comic that felt like it was already taking place in a late-stage comic book world one filled with many different heroes who had all joined different teams and had already experienced decades worth of conflict with other supernatural beings. Because of the ever-raising stakes of comic book stories across those decades, the world of comic book heroes become very different from our own, starting off as very similar, but eventually becoming places that are filled with absurd levels of danger. Invincible hones in on that very early, such as we see in the first episode of the Amazon Prime series, with the White House being attacked so often that Mark's mother is certain that the president doesn't really live there anymore, and that it's just for show. Every day, the world was facing a new massive problem, such as interdimensional beings trying to conquer the Earth through portals, and cruise ships just constantly sailing through crack and filled oceans like we see in Season 2. Over the decades, one hero like Superman faced so many giant threats that to imagine him existing in a world with every other DC superhero would be to imagine a world that is on the brink of destruction every single day, where no human can go more than a few years without experiencing severe trauma from some random villainous attack, and the events are presented as much more traumatic than in your average comic book, where people go back to their normal lives after each crazy event without much drama. In one episode of Invincible, for instance, Mark's college is attacked by a 
madman who ends up performing Frankenstein surgeries on some of the people there. And there are real consequences for this in the characters' lives. They don't just go back to living a normal life, even the ones who don't get hurt themselves end up having severe issues thinking about what their loved ones have been through. The need for comics to get crazier and crazier has led to the perfect foundation in Invincible for the next level of subversion in the franchise, which is its focus on death. Now, death does actually occur even in some of the most wholesome superhero comics aimed at a young audience, but it's generally done with a sense of grand drama and respect for the characters, and of course, without too much blood or gore. The idea of death in a superhero story is to show it as something that you should never cause, as something that only villains are responsible for, and that when this does happen, it is an immense loss that you have to deal with emotionally. It's a story formula that teaches young people to take death seriously when it does occur. However, in a world full of heroes and villains, Invincible opts to show death for what it would be instead of what it should be in our culture, which is this very traumatic thing that is happening all around these people as they are trying to live normal lives in a world filled with superheroes and their villains. The show is of course known for its massive focus on gore, which I understand the idea behind, as it shows that in a world where these things do exist, it's not all fun and adventure. You would have to see horrifying things to be a hero, and so the show gives you those horrifying images. Though we don't really want to show too much of that here in a video, as its value is 100% only in the way it's used in the narrative for someone like me at least. The shocking deaths and their images remind us that this isn't some playground to play hero in, as Mark himself clearly wants to do. When he runs in to help people early on in Season 1, such as with the interdimensional traveling aliens, he comes in warning the attackers to stop, but doing that only allows them to kill even more people while Mark tries to look like a cool hero. The show, and with it the comic, are about these little moments of taking what we expect out of a superhero story beat, and showing us something way more grim that would likely actually happen if these superhero powers existed. These elements were all important in making people love Invincible as a comic, and then as an animated series on Amazon Prime, however, they are not the key thing that the new fans of the Amazon Prime series would generally fixate on. Many fans of the animated series are fans of the comic, and as a result, many of them are watching the show with nothing but the expectation that the various stories they enjoyed will be adapted. But fans of the TV series often have different mindsets, with some of them not wanting any spoilers from the comics at all so they can enjoy it like a typical TV show. However, the approach to enjoying a comic and enjoying a TV series, even about the same story, can be extremely different. There is a reason the more serious versions of the live-action Batman were more more successful than the cheesy campy versions which were modeled after the existing comics. Cheese and camp work great in a cartoon style such as a comic, and they can be used as part of the internal humor that helps push the plot past certain things that wouldn't realistically happen. But the fun of live action is that you can approach it more seriously, and without the cartoon art style, the cheese and camp doesn't play so well. Now when it comes to animation in TV and comics, both can have the same tone, which in the case of Invincible is not actually cheesy. But but they still have different approaches to enjoying them in terms of structure. Comic books are known for releasing 12 issues a year, which can be relatively short compared to episodes. Because of that, many comics don't deal with one-off stories these days, and instead, they are constantly telling multi-part stories across four or even more issues. In today's world of serialized television, what people are often expecting when going into a TV show is a steadily moving focus on a key plot, with there being grand movements forward with the key plot each season particularly in the finale. TV shows are known more so for focusing on one character and his particular story with subplots branching off from that. A lot of the reason people enjoy TV in this format is because TV tends to release for a shorter time range than comics. At best, most shows can expect 22 weeks a year with a new episode released, and that is less than half a year, with there being a giant hiatus right in the middle of the year. While those 22 weeks would be filled with more content than the 12 issues of a comic book, the comics would still release every month, leaving no gap or hiatus. With that in mind, TV would begin to focus more so on making seasons feel like their own complete stories, and even if they would build into a bigger narrative, a sense of finality helped people feel fulfilled during the wait for the next season, with the finale also often having a cliffhanger to make sure people come back to see what new plot it just set up. 
Comics didn't have hiatuses the way TV shows did with summers off, or like how many animated shows release now, with just one day of all eight episodes being dropped, and then nothing for a year. Because of that, the art of enjoying a comic is about enjoying the longer, more drawn out way it tells its stories. What you look forward to isn't an ending per se, though each arc of course did have its own conclusion. Instead, you were more excited about what was going to happen next, how things would evolve and get crazier. Superhero comic books, in many ways, are not like the cartoon adaptions of superheroes many of us grew up with such as the Teen Titans, but more so like the soap operas of daytime television, both focusing on creating a world to constantly live in and to make bigger and bigger with the crazy events happening within it, instead of a narrative working towards a particular goal for a series which is known to have only a limited number of seasons. For fans of the animated series of Invincible, the goal of the series feels like it is Mark and his story with Omni-Man, his father. This is of course the big overarching plot, the premise within the premise for our main character to focus on, and it was a great hook. Episode 1 ended with Mark's father attacking the Guardians of the Globe, the in-world parallel to the Justice League, murdering them violently. This sets off the chain of events that reveal Omni-Man is no hero, but a conquering alien from another world who was sent to Earth to annihilate its greatest defenders so that he can conquer it entirely. This reached a climax at the end of Season 1, when Omni-Man beats his own son for refusing to work with him before Omni-Man runs off into space. Fans were stoked for this development after the plot felt like it was pushed to the background for a lot of the season, with some fans not understanding why so much focus was given to the other plots like those interdimensional conquerors or the ongoing plot with the planet Mars. Season 2 became disappointing to a lot of fans when, after an extra long wait for the production itself to complete and a big gap in the middle of what felt like a very short 8 episode season, the plot involving Omni-Man got very little advancement, and when it did, it was in the mid-season finale and instead of in the series finale. Fans of the TV structure were also a bit disappointed it would seem, with the finale not focusing on Omni-Man, but on a new plot that had been introduced at the start of season 2, that of the dimension hopping Angstrom. The animated adaption of Invincible leans into the comic system of storytelling. It does adapt these ideas into 40 minute episodes with 8 minute seasons, but it introduces recurring concepts the way a comic book does in order for the events to properly play out in the story the way they do there. Omni-Man's plot is important and great, but the way it's weaved into the story is like that of a comic, without a focus on seasons, and instead a focus on smaller yet recurring arcs. The Omni-Man plot is more so used to inform the mindset of Mark Grayson in particular, who represents the expectations of the typical superhero comic book reader. He wants to be a hero, and he has a fantasy based on what that means from reading his own comic books like Seance Dog, and when he finds out his dad is actually a mass murderer and conqueror, that actually cements the idea in his head that causing death is the worst thing you can do, even in this world where death is a very common occurrence because of superhero antics. Instead of Mark's morals being the backbone of the world that he lives in, it is something he adopts in particular from reading sanitized entertainment for kids, but then has traumatized into his soul on a deeper level because of just how horrifying his father's actions really are. To kill someone meant to be like his dad, and not like the image of his father he had built up in his head as a real hero. For Mark to cause a death, even against a villain, would be to use violence simply to conquer, instead of using his powers in order to help people. This becomes important to arcs that have virtually nothing to do with Omni-Man, such as the season 2 finale, tying him into the story but still leaving fans of the Omni-Man plot feeling unsatisfied, even with the little advancement of Omni-Man's story we get at the end of the episode. Season 2 introduced Angstrom in the first episode where Mark was sent in to destroy his machines, which leads to him merging the minds of him and his alternate selves into a horrifying monstrosity. Angstrom already had the power of portal travel and was trying to use that to achieve some sort of good for his reality, though it was going to be with him as the massive mind behind that good, and thus a bit of a prideful endeavor to exalt himself over others. Mark was probably wrong to destroy his machines, and went in blind destroying it off of Cecil's orders, but he is ultimately the only good Mark in the multiverse, while the others, according to Angstrom himself, sided with Omni-Man in conquering the Earth and other parallel realities. Engstrom honestly had very little development in the season itself, but was brought back for the finale to give the season its bookends. This was done to try and match the more typical serialized TV formula, and I imagine the same thing will happen in season 3, with a new villain introduced in the first episode, and then brought back for the finale to make it feel like a key story was moved forward, while arcs like Omni-Man continue to slowly draw themselves out in the background of the show. However, part of the reason this doesn't satiate fans this season, besides not focusing on 
Omni-Man directly, was that its wrap-up itself very much felt like a love letter to the crazy writing of comic book stories, and thus not very satisfying for people who were expecting more of a TV-styled finale. Engstrom is defeated by Mark, which was the dramatic climax to the season that had Mark doing what he was trying not to the entire time, which is killing someone. The way he cries about how he thought Engstrom was stronger is absolutely brutal, but as far as the plot itself, Mark was left in a dead world with no way home. Very conveniently, he is almost immediately saved by the Guardians of the Galaxy. But of course, if you've seen the finale, you know that this is them from 25 years in the future. They are from Mark's dimension, but as soon as portal hopping and time travel became accessible to them, they knew that they would have to go and save Mark, because things didn't go so well in their dimension despite them still being alive. They send Mark back so that he can completely change the timeline by being there to play his part, and that wraps things up in a little neat bow. But it was kind of unnecessary from a storytelling perspective, as Angstrom's powers could have helped Mark get back home before he delivered the final blow. Instead, the writers purposely left Mark here so that they could use this crazy twist in order to have Mark be saved. They weren't out of ideas, but rather this was something they very specifically wanted to add into the main narrative. Now, for people who have only seen the show and haven't read this or really any superhero comics, this seems like a completely wild, out-of-nowhere, off-the-wall way to end the story. A deus ex machina of epic proportions that raises so many questions and, like I said, felt unnecessary when Engstrom's powers could have brought Mark back before his death. But for those who have even just a little bit of comic book experience, this is a very fun way to wrap up a plot within a story like Invincible, which, in its comic book form, was very much about the exploitation of comic book arcs and tropes as we discussed earlier. Invincible basically closed out one crazy comic book arc built off of the existing trope of multiverses within superhero stories by bringing in another crazy comic book trope, time travel. Comics are about drawing things out, as I said, and one way to do that is to copy the basic idea for arcs that you see in other comic book stories. Especially with so many comics being under one umbrella like Marvel or DC, these plot scenarios quickly go from unique story ideas to recycled tropes that even Sonic the Hedgehog and Buffy the Vampire Slayer have used. Sonic, for instance, had an arc I read as a kid about Sonic becoming the king of Planet Mobius 25 years in the future, marrying the Princess Sally, with everyone around him having new important positions in the world, and their kids being the next generation of heroes to help them in the battles against Robotnik. This was a bonkers comic arc over 100 issues into the Archie comics run that came just after Sonic returned from his Lost in Space arc, where he had traveled across the galaxy and hung out with aliens and even met Tails' parents for some reason, who live on a distant planet. Buffy, for its comic book sequel to the TV series, immediately jumped into comic book territory by having a crazy four-part arc where Buffy travels to the future and meets another vampire slayer centuries down the road. The point is that time travel is basically just something comic book enthusiasts look forward to. It's as common to them as the redemption arc is to the greater genres, and when you introduce a new world that is building into crazier comic book scenarios, seeing how time travel and the future of the world will factor into the story is something that fans basically expect. Having it used as a deus ex machina probably didn't land well for people who are more used to the TV format than that of comic books. But for people who had grown up reading stories that had this kind of crazy plot, development, having it come in as a way to save the day while potentially setting up more time travel characters in the future was actually really fun. And at the end of the day, it's the people who enjoy those crazy comic book stories that are going to enjoy the animated series as well, as the animated series is trying to be true to its comic book roots instead of making it something entirely new for a TV audience and what they're used to as far as structure. The comic book series was very much a love letter to the comic book industry as a whole and how it inspires the minds of people to think about the deeper ramifications of the comic book worlds. And as jarring as that can be to see in the TV format, I hope the animated series continues to explore those ideas as they are really fun to see. But what do you guys think? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below, and I'll see you guys next time.